Hey everyone, welcome back to the Apologetic Central. Today, we're diving into a fascinating debate that's been reignited recently in the world of Christian apologetics. We're exploring the question, did Kant influence Cornelius Van Til's apologetics? This topic has stirred quite a bit of discussion between presuppositionalists and classicalists, so let's unpack these complex ideas together and see if we can find a path forward for both camps. Recently, Matt Marino published an article on the Reformed Classicalist website discussing Kant's influence on Cornelius Van Til's apologetics. This sparked considerable debate. Presuppositionalists quickly dismissed the piece as yet another misinterpretation of Van Til. Meanwhile, classicalists argued that presuppositionalism still confuses ontological and epistemological starting points and leans toward idealism. This controversy has reignited calls for conferences and dialogues between the two camps. I haven't contributed to this debate for some time, but I see this as a valuable moment to revisit these objections. Perhaps a fresh examination will allow me to articulate the differences more effectively and propose a path forward for both groups. I won't delve into detailed introductions of Kant's or Van Til's philosophies, assuming you're already somewhat familiar with both figures and their ideologies. Let's start with the subject and the object. At the core of the debate is the relationship between the subject and the object. The subject is the individual or mind attempting to comprehend reality. The object is the entity being understood. For instance, if you aim to understand a ball, you are the subject and the ball is the object. The critical question is, how can you truly know what the ball is in itself? Does the ball imprint its essence onto your mind, or does your mind assign meaning to the ball for you to understand it? This brings us to realism versus idealism. Realism is a philosophical stance where subjects, minds are considered passive during the interpretation process. In this view, objects of experience actively imprint their natures or meanings onto the subjects. Because the mind is passive, proper cognitive functioning should lead two different subjects to understand the object in the same way, assuming no perceptual or cognitive distortions. This philosophy posits that truth is objective and rooted in the properties of objects themselves. On the other hand, idealism is a philosophical approach where subjects, minds, play an active role in the interpretation process. Greg Bonson likened this process to how water is formed into ice cubes, the objects, like water, are initially chaotic and formless. When they're placed into containers and frozen, they adopt a structured form. Similarly, the mind acts as a container, molding the objects of experience to conform to its mental categories. Consequently, under idealism, truth becomes subjective. It's no longer anchored in the external reality of objects, but rather in the individual's mental perceptions. Now let's delve into Kant's philosophy. Kant marked a significant departure from the prevailing realism of his time, which posited that minds should conform to experience. He introduced what he described as a philosophical Copernican revolution. Drawing an analogy to Copernicus, who shifted the perceived center of the solar system from Earth to the Sun, Kant proposed that the subject mind should be seen as the center of knowledge rather than the objects of perception. Kant differentiated between the noumenal and the phenomenal realms. The noumenal represents things as they are in themselves, independent of our perception, essentially what objects are in and of themselves. The phenomenal, on the other hand, refers to how these things appear to us once they have been processed or interpreted by our minds. Marino writes, What Kant put in the place of the older realist outlook was a two-tiered framework, in which the metaphysical way things are was placed above the line. This he called the noumenal. Most people tend to focus on the objects of this upper tier as being God, logic, love, justice, freedom, the self, and what he called the thing in itself, ding and sitch. The significance of this last object is usually what is missed. It is not simply that things up there, that is, spiritual or invisible things, are inaccessible to reason. It is the essence of anything and everything that is inaccessible. In other words, it is precisely the way things are, outside of our minds in some common field, which was the old pipe dream of metaphysics. Now below the line Kant placed the appearance of things to each of us. This he called the phenomenal. Again, those who miss the first point will miss the significance here as well. 
Superficial treatments of Kant take this lower tier to be the visible world studied by science. Indeed it is. However, that is precisely a post-metaphysical surface of those phenomena. If one is consistent, each set of data must be reduced to how it appears to me or to you. According to Kant, the objects of experience do not inherently contain any order for the mind to discover. Rather, the mind actively imposes its own structure on these objects. This concept has significant implications for Christian theology. For instance, if we interpret the Westminster Confession of Faith, which describes God as infinite and incomprehensible, through a Kantian lens, we arrive at a troubling conclusion. God, being beyond our sensory experience and thus residing in the noumenal realm, is essentially unknowable. According to Kantian philosophy, the God described in our confessions transcends what we can comprehend or experience. Therefore, any human attempt to describe God is inherently limited, subjective, and ultimately fails to make contact with who God really is. In response, theologians often emphasize the concept of divine revelation. They argue that, although God may not be directly accessible as an object of knowledge, humans can still know him because he has revealed himself in nature and scripture. However, this claim isn't enough to escape the Kantian critique. According to Kant, any revelation from God would necessarily be processed through human understanding and perception. This means the revelation would also be confined by the inherent limitations and categorizations of the human mind. As a result, our understanding of such revelations would not be a direct apprehension of God as he is in himself, but rather a constructed and thus subjective understanding shaped by our cognitive faculties. If idealism holds true, it leads to skepticism about our ability to truly know God. Given this implication, it's commendable that Marino and our classical counterparts strive to purge Kantian influences from Christian philosophy. Eliminating such influences is essential if we're to secure objective knowledge of God, or of any subject for that matter. If Kant's ideas have unduly influenced us, Marino's efforts to help us divest ourselves of this philosophical legacy are indeed valuable. Marino argues that Van Til, and by extension his followers, have been influenced by Kant. Let's examine Marino's reasons for this concern. Now, on to Van Til. Van Til entered the philosophical scene in the 1920s, earning accolades for reforming the realm of apologetics, which had been predominantly guided by classical methodologies. He challenged the classical approach of proving God's existence from subordinate facts, asserting instead that the existence of God is the fundamental fact necessary for reasoning and predicating it all. Classicalists, however, remain unconvinced by Van Til's approach. They argue that his assertion that the existence of God is foundational for all reasoning and predication is not as revolutionary as it might appear. Marino writes, Now first we must see that the classicalist will wholly agree that we ought to discern that God's existence is a necessary condition for human knowledge in exactly the way Van Til says. Marino and others acknowledge that Van Til was addressing more than just ontological issues. He was also making an epistemological argument. Specifically, Van Til posited that God is the precondition of intelligibility for all knowledge and understanding. However, Marino contends that Van Til's epistemological claim is flawed and exhibits traces of Kantian influence. He argues that it's indeed possible to know and accomplish things without acknowledging God as the precondition of intelligibility. Therefore, in Marino's view, Van Til and modern presuppositionalists confuse ontology with epistemology. The heart of the critique against Van Til is that his approach is seen as fideistic, emphasizing a deep reliance on faith over empirical or rational evidence. Marino discusses the Kantian bridge into Van Tilianism, highlighting Van Til's insistence on starting from a presupposed theological basis, frankly starting from above. Classicalists maintain that despite Van Til's criticisms of Kant, his method still relies on the Kantian idea that knowledge is not just about empirical observation, realistic, but also about the interpretive frameworks we bring to our experiences, idealistic. It's claimed that Van Til's assertion that, without the presupposition of God, all reasoning and factual understanding would be meaningless, aligns with Kant's notion that our perception and understanding of the world are significantly shaped by the mental structures we bring to bear on our experiences. Thus, 
Marino interprets von Till's method as Kantian and fideistic, where Christian doctrine becomes a lens, even if an indispensable lens, through which all knowledge is interpreted. This signals a shift from objective understanding to a knowledge system rooted in theological presuppositions. This, Marino argues, demonstrates a significant departure from a realist epistemology to one that prioritizes faith-based assumptions. The same kind of critique can be heard in a recent interview featuring James Dolezal and Matthew Barrett. Dolezal states that some Reformed Protestants have adopted a form of idealism, he says this idealist perspective contends that humans, in their natural capacity, cannot truly understand nature as it is. Consequently, they require an extraordinary supernatural illumination, beyond mere rationality and the natural intelligibility of the world, to truly perceive and comprehend nature. Dolezal then proceeds to equate this idealistic perspective with Karl Barth and Van Til. He claims that both men argued for a revelational epistemology. I was quite discouraged by Dolezal equating Van Til and Barth in this way. He suggests they assume, similar to idealists, that humans inherently lack direct access to nature and thus require additional principles or concepts to clarify and make nature comprehensible. This is the view espoused by Kant, who argued that the human mind structures our understanding of nature through its inherent faculties. Marino and Dolezal, opposing this idealism and Kantian influences, argue for the intellectual, realist tradition of medieval philosophy. According to them, this tradition provides adequate resources to address and counter the modernist challenges introduced by Kant by postulating that man has direct access to nature. In other words, there's no extraordinary illumination or thought structures required to see the facts for what they are. In short, the charge levied against Van Til and his followers is that they are implicit idealists. Now let's discuss some initial responses to Marino's critique. Supporters of Van Til's philosophy quickly defended it against Marino's criticisms. They argued that Van Til merely maintained the necessity of God's existence as a precondition for the truth. However, this defense frustrated classical apologists because it failed to highlight how Van Til's approach differed from traditional classical apologetics. Surely Van Til wasn't merely making an ontological argument? The frustration among Van Til's followers was also heightened as they found themselves repeatedly clarifying, once again, that Van Til did not claim unbelievers are incapable of knowing anything. However, classical apologists argue that if unbelievers are indeed capable of knowledge, this seems to align more with classical apologetics, specifically realism. If Van Til acknowledged that unbelievers could know things without acknowledging God, then his position seems to retreat significantly. This suggests that one can know much without understanding the underlying conditions for that knowledge, a point also discussed in Marino's article. This leaves the question, how does Van Til's system distinctively differ from the classical approach? Misunderstandings persist, and observing the recent exchanges has highlighted the frustration felt by both sides once again. This situation leads me to wonder why there can't be more charity between the two camps. If classical apologists are quick to label Van Til as an idealist and meet resistance from Van Tilians, perhaps this should prompt them to delve deeper into Van Til's philosophy rather than dismissing it as contradictory. Similarly, Van Tilians should seriously engage with the concerns raised by classical apologists rather than dismiss them as ignorant. By doing so, both sides can advance this crucial dialogue together. In the spirit of fostering mutual understanding and having taken the time to appreciate Marino's perspective, I'm now prepared to respond from a Van Tilian viewpoint to his concerns about Vale being perceived as a Kantian idealist and a fideist. This response will also aim to elucidate the Van Tilian assertion that God is the necessary precondition for intelligible experience. So, here's a Van Tilian response. Van Til encourages us to shift our philosophical starting point. Rather than beginning with the debate between realism and idealism, what Lane Tipton describes as the horizontal relationship between subjects and objects, we should consider the vertical relationship involving subjects, objects, and God their creator. This fundamental shift underpins Van Til's approach, as introduced in the opening sections of his Survey of Christian Philosophy. Here, 
Van Til sets his perspective apart from both classicalists, realism as traditionally understood, and Kantians, idealism as traditionally understood. He doesn't align strictly with either camp, although he does express a preference for the realist philosophies of ancient thinkers over modern ones, praising their pursuit of objective truth. Nonetheless, Van Til argues that before exploring the relationships between subjects and objects, we must first consider their relationships with God. This, he asserts, is the more foundational inquiry. Van Til writes, The core of our system of philosophy is our belief in the triune God of Scripture and in what he has revealed concerning himself and his purposes for man and his world. According to Scripture, God has created the universe. God has created time and space. God has created all the facts of science, that is, God has created all objects. God has created the human mind. In this human mind, God has laid the laws of thought according to which it is to operate, that is, God has created all subjects. In the facts of science, God has laid the laws of being according to which they function. In other words, the impress of God's plan is upon his whole creation. We may characterize this whole situation by saying that the creation of God is a revelation of God. God revealed himself in nature, and God also revealed himself in the mind of man. Thus it is impossible for the mind of man to function except in an atmosphere of revelation, and every thought of man when it functioned normally in this atmosphere of revelation would express the truth as laid in the creation by God. We may therefore call a Christian epistemology a revelational epistemology. Van Til continues, How can the human mind know anything about any of the facts of the universe, objects, if these facts, as well as the mind itself subjects, are not related upon the basis of a more fundamental unity in the plan of God? Van Til posits that the unity of the subject-object relationship is not centered on human cognition. Instead, and this cannot be stressed enough, he emphasizes that the fundamental principle of their unity is the plan of God. This encompasses the decree of God, alongside his acts of creation and providence. Thus, we can say that there is an organic connection between objects and subjects, and this connection forms part of the atmosphere of revelation in which we operate. In saying this, Van Til has distinguished himself completely from Kant. Any claim that Van Til is Kantian in his approach cannot hold water. Van Til writes, It is exactly Kant's contention that the human mind does have a sphere of knowledge of its own apart from its relation to God and apart from the relation of the facts to God. And this position would not be tenable unless the mind of man were independent of the divine mind in some essential respect. In reality, it matters not whether one says that man knows one fact or a thousand facts or all facts apart from God. In all cases, he is equally antitheistic. The doctrine of creation establishes a world that is external and created, ensuring that subjects and objects are interrelated in a way that facilitates objective knowledge of what God has planned, created, and revealed. Contrary to Kant, and more akin to realistic philosophies, the human mind, subject, encounters intrinsically intelligible objects, being both created by God and revelatory of Him. Consequently, the intelligibility of experience is not a construct of the human mind. Rather, the mind is designed to apprehend the intelligibility of experiences as defined and interpreted by God. So, against Kant, Van Til denies that objects must conform to the constructive understanding of man. In this sense, Van Til cannot be labeled as Kantian or idealistic, and Marino can rest assured that Van Til has successfully avoided any undue influence from Kant. Van Til contends that we start our philosophical inquiry with the being, knowledge, revelation, and work of the triune God. God endows all subjects and objects with intrinsic intelligibility and reveals himself through all created objects and even within the human mind. It is God, not the constructive capacities of human understanding, who confers intelligibility on objects. His revelation permeates all of creation. Now let's consider God as the precondition for knowledge. With the background provided, we can now better understand what Van Til meant when he described God as the precondition for knowledge. Importantly, God being the precondition for knowledge does not mean it's a set of principles guiding how the human mind should ideally interpret facts in the Kantian sense. Instead, Van Til's assertion points to a foundational aspect of reality 
that transcends mere idealistic interpretations. The doctrine of creation is pivotal in understanding how God serves as the precondition for all knowledge. This foundational principle explains how non-Christians can possess knowledge even without consciously believing in God. Contrary to what would be expected if Van Til were a Kantian, that unbelievers cannot know anything, the reality is more nuanced. Unbelievers, despite suppressing the knowledge of God due to unrighteousness, continue to exist in a world rich with divine revelation. This world, structured by God's creative act, upholds the inherent relationships between subjects and objects that allow for knowledge to occur. Therefore, Marino's statement that Van Til is actually saying more than that God must exist in order for our reason to operate here. He is saying that one must know that God exists in order for our reason to operate here is not entirely accurate. Van Til posits that the framework for rational thought and the acquisition of knowledge is already divinely established, regardless of an individual's conscious acknowledgement of God's existence. For example, my baby daughter is not capable of articulating belief in God or grasping the metaphysical insight that God's existence is necessary for knowledge. However, she doesn't need to consciously understand this. She is already immersed in God's revelatory environment. Without knowing or articulating it, she functions as a creation within God's world, engaging with objects that God has imbued with intrinsic meaning. This entire scenario can be aptly described as theistic realism, where the relationship between subjects and objects is maintained within a framework established by God, independent of human cognitive awareness of this divine orchestration. It's precisely for this reason that we can read and understand Scripture before fully comprehending Scripture itself. In contrast, for the idealist, Scripture would be unable to convey knowledge that extends beyond the mental constructs already present in the subject's mind. If Van Til were an idealist, he might have argued that we inherently possess all the crucial epistemological components of Scripture needed to shape our epistemology before reading Scripture, suggesting that our understanding of divine truth is already embedded within our mental constructs. Thus, God being the precondition for knowledge is an ontological claim with epistemological consequences. Far from conflating epistemology with ontology, Van Til saw that both disciplines can be distinguished, but our beliefs about ontology will surely influence what we can say about epistemology. It's at this juncture that we get to Van Til's presuppositional apologetic. When Van Til discusses his apologetic approach as transcendental, he is deliberately repurposing Kant's terminology to contrast sharply with Kant's philosophical framework. This is what Van Til means by his transcendental method. We must seek to determine what presuppositions are necessary to any object of knowledge in order that it may be intelligible to us. It is not as though we already know some facts and laws to begin with, irrespective of the existence of God, in order then to reason from such a beginning to further conclusions. It is certainly true that if God has any significance for any object of knowledge at all, the relation of God to that object of knowledge must be taken into consideration from the outset. It is this fact that the transcendental method seeks to recognize. Thus, while unbelievers are capable of knowing things, they do so despite their non-Christian philosophies, not because of them. This is a crucial point often overlooked by Van Til's critics. Unbelievers can acquire knowledge, but this is only practical because they exist within God's revelational atmosphere. Thus, unbelievers can do science, math, politics, and a plethora of other things alongside Christians. And where we find truth revealed in these non-believers, we must accept it for what it is, as all truth is God's truth. However, in principle, if one were to fully accept what unbelievers claim about their beliefs regarding themselves, God, and the world, that they do not live in an atmosphere of divine revelation, then, according to their own assertions, they would not be able to know anything. It's unnatural for humans to reject their creator and attempt to function autonomously, claiming that facts can be known independently of God's revelational atmosphere. Humans were created in the image of God, endowed with an inherent religious fellowship and knowledge of Him. We are given the mandate to interpret, discover, and manage creation in covenantal obedience, fully acknowledging that this is His world.
Van Til encourages us to press the antithesis when humans rebel against this natural knowledge of God by feigning ignorance of God's existence or when going so far as to claim his non-existence. By feigning ignorance or denying God's existence, unbelievers are establishing a specific ontological framework, one that has profound epistemological ramifications. It's precisely here that God must be demonstrated as a precondition for knowledge. That is, if you do not presuppose the existence of God, as God is the precondition for intelligibility, then, in principle, you cannot know anything at all, an epistemological assertion. However, the very fact that you do possess knowledge contradicts and undermines your claim of ignorance regarding God's existence. Van Til writes, Belief in God is the most human attitude conceivable. It is abnormal not to believe in God. We must therefore hold that only the Christian theist has real objectivity, while the others are introducing false prejudices or subjectivity. Van Til contends that the very act of reasoning abnormally, as if God does not exist, and as if humans are not his creations, ironically gives rise to philosophical dilemmas such as idealism, which fosters subjectivity. Instead of attempting to prove God's existence from non-Christian starting points, we adopt a transcendental approach. We argue that unless the God of the Bible exists and the system of knowledge presented in the Bible is accurate, it is impossible to know any fact at all truly. Van Til discussed the concepts of proximate and ultimate starting points to elucidate how knowledge is approached differently depending on one's foundational beliefs. Proximately, both Christians and non-Christians begin their process of knowing in a similar manner, engaging with the world through the same empirical and rational means. To elaborate, here's an extensive quote from Van Til's survey of Christian epistemology, which captures the essence of our discussion. Summing up our discussion of the matter of the object of knowledge as far as the starting point is concerned, we enumerate the following points of importance. A. We may start our process of acquiring knowledge and of discussing whether we have true knowledge with any fact, but this is only the immediate or proximate starting point. The real difficulty begins with the question of an ultimate starting point. Here the question is as to what we mean by the existence or denotation of any fact. It will not do to take for granted that the term existence can intelligibly be applied to any fact if that fact is thought of as separated from God. That is just the one point at issue. In the second place, the question of connotation must come up here. Again, it will not do to take for granted that the connotation of a fact can be established apart from any reference to God. The whole contention of the Christian theistic position is that what is called the subject-object relation, that is, the possibility of my having knowledge of any object whatsoever, is unintelligible except upon the presupposition that every subject of knowledge, since subjects are from this point of view also objects, owes its existence and its connotation, in the last analysis, to God. Hence, it will not do for antitheists to begin their whole process of reasoning upon the assumption of the falsity of the theistic position. The very contention of theism is that a fact, to be known truly, must be known as a theistic fact. Hence, it is manifestly illogical and unfair for the opponents of this position to begin by assuming that facts can be known as antitheistic facts. b. A similar argument holds with respect to the relation of Scripture to true knowledge. Christian theism holds that without the light of Scripture, no fact can be known truly. Hence, it will not do for our opponents to throw out this contention at the outset as something which is not a live option to an educated person. The argument for the necessity of Scripture, we have seen, is theistic in the sense that a true theism stands or falls with the position given to Scripture. c. The second main question considered was the object-object relation. It is the question of nature and history. The contention of Christian theism is that there must be laws in nature and in history, but that these laws have no meaning except upon the presupposition of God that furnishes the binding cement for all the facts of spatial, temporal experience. Accordingly, it will not do for our opponents to assume that nature and history exist and operate independently of God. I hope this discussion has added value to the ongoing conversation. I've endeavored to demonstrate that Van Til should not be labeled a Kantian or an idealist. Furthermore, 
I've tried to show that Van Til did not conflate epistemology and ontology. What still needs to be done is to show how Van Til's theistic realism is superior to the realism of the medieval theologians. But we'll leave that for a later date. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, take care.